you've got to remember the law of the farm. You cannot sow something today and reap tomorrow. A seed has to go through various seasons before it turns into a fully blown tree. So is the case with investments. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. Today the markets were down 600 points, around 600. Any idea? What was the reason? Any idea, sir? Any idea? What was the reason? Global factors. Global factors. Some rumors. Rumors. Fear. Random event. Fear. Fear. Random event. Random event. Actually, very honestly, when the markets go up or down, we never have a reason. But we always want to take orders. That's why analysis never works in the market. But the job of the analysis is always secure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor will always be able to give a reason. You know. So, <clears throat> today we have an interesting topic. These are times when <coughs> markets are less crazy and regarding certain stocks which are highly overpriced. Even people are suggesting that we buy these stocks. And it was very important to do the maths, put the figures in place and understand what is happening. So Rajiv has been working on this since last about two weeks and he set up this presentation. Everyone knows about what Warren Buffett says, don't make a loss, that's rule number one. And secondly, rule number two is, don't forget rule number one. Now, what is the meaning of this? Don't make a loss. Don't make a loss. But it's very important to understand the deeper meaning of this quote. And that is, has done an excellent job to really try to analyze what that really means for our companies, for overpriced stocks, and is given certain examples. And I'm sure we'll enjoy this presentation. That is all. So we have this childhood story which says that emperor has no clothes and uh, in the story no one has the guts to tell the emperor that he is not wearing anything. The premise was that whoever says that is a traitor or is not a good person and it took a little child to, who was not aware of the things that can't be told to emperor who came out and said that the emperor is naked. So, today I am playing the role of a child and instead of saying the emperor is naked, we are saying emperor has torn clothes. So, why are we saying that? I will uh, explain that in a bit. Part of the presentation is something which I covered in an article which I wrote for Mint a uh, few days back. So, uh, whenever we are discussing the examples, people who have read the article should try not to answer, so that the other people get a chance. So, all along, various people including myself have been expounding on the virtues of long term investing, saying look at stocks as a part ownership in a business. You should buy and hold for a very, very long time. You should not sell. Uh, you should not fall into the temptation of getting in and out of stocks very frequently and all of that. And there is a book by Thomas Phillips. It is called 100 to 1 in the stock market. Uh, a more popular book is Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits by Philip Fisher. This one was also written many years back and it was rediscovered sometime during the course of last 12 to 15 months. And it be it's become a cult book now. Now everyone talks about 100 to 1. Everyone is hunting for 100 baggers. No one is satisfied now with 
two baggers, three baggers, and so on. So the prevalent view today is buy quality, hold on to the stock till it goes 100x from your purchase price. That's the prevalent view today. It also seems to match with Warren Buffett's saying, which is our favorite holding period is forever. So as I said, I am playing a slightly contrarian view today. When everyone is saying what fantastic clothes the emperor has, I am saying something else. So when Warren Buffett keeps saying our favorite holding period is forever, it is the same Warren Buffett who said this. I made the big mistake in not selling. Several of our larger holdings during the great bubble. He uh, not named the stocks, but implicitly is talking about things like Coca-Cola and Washington Post. You may wonder what I was thinking four years ago when their interest, intrinsic value was lower and their prices far higher. So do I. He is called not selling a mistake. This coming from the same person who keeps saying our favorite holding period is forever. So when we say our favorite holding period is forever, it implies that you generally are not too itchy about selling stocks. But when you keep this in mind, it comes with a caveat. The caveat is that there will be certain times in your investing career where it makes a lot of sense to sell something. And you need not blindly follow the first saying and blindly hold on to something. So before we even delve into that, uh, we'll do a quick mathematical test. And again, people who have read the article should not answer. So what is the average of the first line? You have to add all the numbers and divide by 4. That would be correct. 23.75. Anyone gets a different answer? You have your calculators on your cell phones if someone wants to try it out. The second is 20, 15, 17 and 20. If you add up and divide by 4, answer would be 18. So what if I told you that A and B, this and this are two different stocks and the numbers are returns, annual returns for four, a period of 4 years. So year 1 return on stock A was 40%, year 2 was 50%, year 3 minus 60, year 4 65. And in the case of B, year 1 20, 15, 17 and 20. Which stock is better? Anyone? Assume you have a good enough risk appetite. A is better? B? Who says B? Why? It's consistent. No, but he says I am okay with risk. So as long as you have a four year holding period, how do you care? See, what you care about is finally how much money do you have at the end of your investment horizon. Uh, a bank fixed deposit is the most consistent investment you can ever have. It never gives negative, fixed, uh, negative returns. But would you prefer a bank fixed deposit over equity investments? No, right? So, I am saying answer B is correct, but why is it correct? That's correct. So let's look at this. You buy 
स्टॉक ए एट हंड्रेड फर्स्ट इयर रिटर्न इज फोर्टी परसेंट सो एट द एंड ऑफ इयर वन हंड्रेड विल ग्रो टू वन फोर्टी देन द रिटर्न इज फिफ्टी परसेंट सो वन फोर्टी विल ग्रो टू टू हंड्रेड एंड टेन मल्टीप्लाइड बाय वन पॉइंट फाइव वेन यू हैव अ नेगेटिव सिक्सटी परसेंट रिटर्न दिस एंटायर टू हंड्रेड टेन फॉल्स बाय सिक्सटी परसेंट सो इट फॉल्स टू एटी फोर and then in the final year when you have 65 when you multiply it by 1.65 it grows to 138.60 whereas in the case of b 20 15 17 and 20 100 grows to 120 138 161.46 .46, and 193.75 anyone wants to calculate it can do it uh, i am not playing a parlor trick over here or doing something like a magician this is simple arithmetic so the beauty about investment return is that they are multiplicative you multiply each year's return with the next year's return rather than adding so when you have a long series of numbers let us say if any one of them is zero the entire term becomes zero so if for any particular year your investment return is minus 100 that is your principal falls to zero the series stops over there people think that a positive 10% return is the same as neg negative 10% return with different signs positive 50 is the same as negative 50 there is something called asymmetry of investment returns i'll explain how this works let us say you start with 100 rupees if you double your money in the first year your 100 goes to 200 and you have a minus 50 after that it falls to 100 back if you reverse this you get the same number you start with 100 you have a minus 50 so you fall to 50 and then you get a plus 100 you come back to 100 because you double your money so the order is not important the numbers are important so for small numbers both are very close for minus 10 and 11.11 it's not very different but when you have higher absolute numbers the asymmetry becomes very high if you start with 100 and you have a minus 25 you fall to 75 from 75 to come back to 100 you require a 33.33% return just to break even similarly if you start with 100 and you get a 90% positive it becomes 190 but if you have a minus 90 you fall to 10 and from 10 coming back to 100 is very difficult so that's why there is asymmetry of positive and negative returns in your investing career how much money you are left with at the end of your investment horizon will depend to a large extent on whether you are able to avoid these kind of problems if you look at the investing track record of buffett and berkshire and all it's not that they have been so brilliant at identifying the next microsoft or next google or next hot biotech company it's all about avoiding the big mistakes they were able to avoid things like the dot com bubble or they were able to avoid the mortgage lending bubble and the financial crisis so survival is more important so uh, he keeps saying if you avoid the big investing mistakes you have most of the work done already for you so that is the significance of this statement don't lose money so if you lose money coming back to break even is very difficult so today when i am talking about emperor's clothes are torn i am talking about the valuation of some of the best quality companies 
in India. I am playing the role of the small child as I, as I mentioned. Now the reason why I am saying emperor's clothes are torn and not naked is that inherently these are good companies. The companies are not bad. These are not companies with chore promoters or with uh, very leveraged balance sheets or with very poor return on capital or commoditized products or nothing like that. These are inherently very high quality companies. They were identified by some very bright people who have made a lot of money in these stocks. Investors have made money. Today valuations are too excessive. All along I have been saying buy high quality companies, buy high quality companies. Today I am arguing why to avoid some of them and possibly even sell some of them. The correct way of valuing any financial asset or any investment asset for that matter. It could be even a real asset like real estate for example is how much money you are paying right now upfront to buy that asset and how much cash that asset will generate for you over the investment horizon. You bring all that back to the present value using the interest rate formula and you see whether the investment makes sense or not. However, in the case of equity shares, difficulty is that those future cash flows are not easy to identify. So what we have is a we have a simple ratio called the price to earnings ratio. Price to earnings ratio is take the current market price of each share divided by earnings per share or take the market capitalization which is the full value of the company divided by the net profit of the company either one of them. So what does the price earning ratio indicate? You can look at it at two ways. How many years will the company take to earn what you have paid for the company? So if the price earning ratio is 5, then 5 years profits will be equal to your purchase price, assuming no growth other way to look at it is you reverse the price earning ratio you take the reciprocal of it so if price earning ratio is 5 you do 1 by 5 1 by 5 is 20 percent so on your investment the company is earning 20 percent profit or at the price at which you are paying if the price earning ratio is 10 then 1 by 10 so company is generating 10 percent on your purchase price if it is 20, it is generating 5% on your purchase price. So this is a very simple heuristic. It's not fail proof. So uh, if in a particular year a company has made a loss, then it should have a negative value. That is not what price earning ratio says. It should be used with caution, but just as a simple tool to understand, it is many a times effective. So this is a random list of some high quality companies and some mid caps, not that high quality but some mid caps that I have taken which have done well in terms of stock price performance in the last few years. And we are looking at their price to earnings ratio today. So something like Bosch is trading at 77 times earnings. United Spirits makes losses currently, it does not have a price earning ratio. Gillette, it is at 192 times earnings. Uh, maybe their profits are depressed right now because of high ad spend and so on. We will look at uh, various other factors also. Jubilant Food Works, the company which runs the Domino's franchise in India around 84 times. Ikra I have included one of the stocks that we own so that 
people don't accuse me of bias only talking about stocks that I don't own. Sarah Sanitary Wear, Nestle, Groove Finance. Usually financial stocks are looked at in terms of price to book ratio. Uh, Groove Finance, price to book ratio of about 14 times. Whirlpool, Dabur, Kitex Garments, so various companies are there. If we say a price earning ratio of 77, it means that the company will take 77 years to earn what we are paying for the company. Reciprocal of 77, 1 by 77, it's about, it's not even 2 percent, it's less than 1 and a half percent return on your purchase price. So why would anyone pay a price earning ratio of anything more than 6, 7? Because if we are saying price earning ratio of 10, it means that 10 percent return on your purchase price. So most companies trade at price earning ratio about, about 10. That is usually because companies grow profits over a period of time they are able to throw out cash flows and they are able to give you dividend yields and various reasons. So company may trade at 15 times earnings, 20, 25 times earnings. So why would a company trade at 77 times earnings? You would expect that the company is really high quality and it would be growing at a phenomenal pace. It would be growing its profits very significantly. So what is Bosch? It is a top-notch auto ancillary company. So, unlike other auto ancillary companies which are at the mercy of the uh, big auto giants called OEMs, original equipment manufacturers like let's say Tata Motors or Maruti or Hyundai and so on, this company has its own standing. They are not at the, back, uh, at the mercy of the larger players. They have all the good qualities that you can want. High return on capital and a moat and they have done well in the past, promoters are good and so on. So let's look at their financials. What have they done in the past? Look at the sales here. Uh, around 6,900 crores, December 2010. That has grown to 9,574 crores. It has grown, but not at a phenomenal pace. Not, it's not a new startup technology company or a biotech company which has suddenly discovered a cure for cancer. It's definitely not in that league. Look at the profits. In 2011, it had 1123 crores. 2014, it has in fact seen lower profits. The profits have not gone anywhere. It's almost like a flat line or a hard kind of thing, up down, up down. There is no upward trend that is there. So if you are having a company with a thousand crore profit, would you be willing to pay 80,000 crores for this company? That is a question, simple question that I have. Now there will be people who will say, give reasons or these people will do well on account of reason A or do well on account of reason B. I am not an expert in all the companies that are listed. I am just asking simple questions. I am like the child who does not know anything. I am asking can we pay 80,000 crores for this company. The stock price has gone up five times in last five years or four years maybe from a stock price of 5000 per share that stock is today at 25,000 rupees a share. And the interesting part is since profits have not grown, if it were to revert to the price earning ratio at which it traded five years back, you will see a 80 percent decline. This is, I am not saying it is going to decline by 80 percent. I am saying if that were to be the case, you could see a 80 percent decline. So uh, leave aside these numbers and all, basically uh, 
Bloomberg has a good function called price earning band. A Bloomberg is a software package or a financial uh, subscription package which some institutions subscribe to. What this chart does is it compares the stock with its own history. It does not project anything into the future. It just says where is this stock traded at historically. So if we look at Myco, it used to trade at about 15 times earnings. Not in the too distant past. In 2009, about 6 years back, it traded at about 15 times earnings. That has gone up to 77 or 80 times earnings. Price earning, as I mentioned, is not the sole criteria. So, uh, even if we were to say, let's say, Gillette has depressed earnings. They are spending a lot of money on advertising and promoting their products and so on. Let us look at price to sales, which is less volatile. Uh, if we look at in the past, it has traded at price earnings even less than 4 or 5 times or 6 times. Today it is trading at somewhere about 9 times price to sales. So we have a big list of companies over here. Most of us would be knowing the positive side of the story, saying Bosch, great company. United Spirits, oh now Diageo is the owner, Vijay Malia Group is out, uh, advertising is not allowed, uh, Indians will consume more liquor going forward, great story, Page Industries, franchisees for Jockey and Speedo, uh, young population will keep growing, Gillette, people will keep shaving, Jubilant, people will keep ordering more pizzas. Ikra, debt market is so underdeveloped, now Moody's has made it their subsidiary now, so great prospects going ahead, Sera Sanitary Wear, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, building toilets, so many homes have to be created, huge prospects, Nestle, consumption story, Gru Finance, rural housing, what not, Whirlpool, everyone wants durables. Dabur, traditional products, MNCs are not even competing in that, that space, uh, homegrown products and wisdom, Kitex, look at their growth rates in the past, look at their financials. For each positive spin, there are some basic questions that you could ask. Kitex makes children's garments, which it sells to people like Walmart. Logically, who should be making higher margins, higher return on capital? Walmart or Kitex? Who has the balance of power? Historically, no one has become very wealthy by supplying to Walmart. You get your basic uh, profitability, but you don't become a billionaire. So, you don't have suppliers to Walmart as Fortune 500 companies. Now this company's a company has been making huge margins and has been seeing huge profit growth and all. Is it sustainable? Maybe yes, maybe no. But there are questions that can be asked. Gru Finance, financial companies trade at, so all PSU banks trade at less than book value, less than one time price to book. Private sector banks, well run banks, people like HDFC and all would be 4 times, 5 times, whatever the ratio is today. Can you pay 14 times price to book? This more than book. Yeah, so uh, somewhere people have stopped asking questions. When people have started looking at 100 to 1 to justify holding on and to justify fresh purchases. Without naming people, uh, there are people who say leverage and buy some of these companies, borrow money and run huge concentrated portfolios, saying own only 4 to 5 stocks and these people are uh, well regarded in the media and 
all of that you will see them uh, in various interviews and you will see them on various channels can these fall 25% can these fall 50% risk is there according to me just by a company being a well run company or being a market leader or being in a high growth phase you cannot blindly buy the company at any valuation and people who have seen the dot com boom and bust would remember i am not even talking about visual softs and penta fours and dsq software people were uh, companies where management was questionable i am talking about companies like infosys and wipro best quality management people who actually grew the company even after the bust the pro, uh, sales went up profits went up but it took many many years for investors to just about break even forget making positive returns so even in the year 2000 these were great companies but they were not great investments purely on account of one factor and which was valuation so if you are owning any of these stocks please don't beat me i am just a small kid asking questions maybe i don't know the answers uh, it's a pretty short presentation today i just didn't want to put things in for the sake of it i just wanted to uh, put up some questions and maybe have a discussion at the end of it thank you any observations any question sorry i have no idea sir i have only questions i have no answers if you want maybe you can enlighten us see the way i would look at it is you can have periods where you do well so uh, in a manufacturing business you may have certain fixed costs in terms of your interest cost depreciation some other fixed costs if you are running at a low capacity and your capacity utilization goes up suddenly the margins would go up profitability would go up or if you are competing suppliers either in the same country or in different countries are facing issues peculiar to that region or to that country you could have these kind of periods so for example if you are supplying garments and you are competing with a company in bangladesh or vietnam for example and bangladeshi currency strengthens either one or there's a big uh, factory collapse in bangladesh and there's a huge backlash of child labor and all that so the developed country stop buying from that country till they get their house in order or for any reason you could see big orders coming your way at good prices is it sustainable i would have my doubts because uh, all these retailers are very smart people they exactly know what input costs are going into your process what is the material what is the labor cost what is the transportation that you incur they will either squeeze you in terms of pricing or some other competitor will come and undercut you and business could go over there i would be not so sure about the sustainability of such a business is making more profit than walmart also in terms of margins and return on capital yes yeah uh, as a group i would think that this if you own equal proportion of all of those stocks as a group i don't think they'll do well maybe one or two companies really have a great business story they will actually work out and uh, they may be cheap even at the current prices 
rather than giving you one particular stock view i am saying today anything which has got to do with fmcg in india some select mid cap and small cap stocks where any of the gurus are associated any of the well known people are associated straight away 4x 5x 10x prices are there anything which has got to do with defense related defense offsets make in india all that business is going to come valuations have suddenly ballooned now a lot of these are price to perfection price to perfection meaning if everything works out you may make moderate returns but if the smallest of the things go wrong you could see prices crashing and this is not for the market as a whole it is not that the entire market is in a bubble it is pockets of high quality so in fact uh, there is a guy called uh, Porenju Velayath he is a south based guy he humorously started one of his talks saying if you identify a company where the promoter is wonderful where return on capital is high where entry barriers are high and he listed all the good qualities he says if you come across such a company don't buy it and especially in today's context saying the valuation will be at nosebleed valuations if uh, it is such a well recognized thing over the period of next 12 months 24 months you could have difficulties even sustaining existing valuations leave aside uh, prices going significantly higher uh, I am not saying this for all the companies I am not an expert in all the sectors all the companies that are out there I am saying based on their own past things are looking stressed in terms of P were already high priced. However, when you look today and you see the five year return, it's just been phenomenal the compounding. Uh, so, what are the common guy make of all this here? When, when do you know when to, I mean, you hold on, you, 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 as they say, you know, right the way, what, what is it that you do? So, will a micro and, for example, a Tata Steel trade at the same multiple? No, both are different quality companies. Uh, showed a Dabur and uh, a chemical and Tata Chemicals trade at the same valuation. The answer is no. Should Titan and Hindalco trade at similar multiples? The answer is no. These are high quality businesses which deserve a higher valuation. But what should that higher valuation be? Should it be 80 times earnings? Should it be triple digit price earning ratios? I am not so sure it's justified today. Uh, and uh, have the profits grown? In some cases, profits have grown. So, for example, Page Industries has seen profits grow. Uh, if it continues to grow profits at these, this pace, maybe the valuation is justified. A lot of brokerages have a strong buy on Page Industries, even as we speak. But uh, has Bosch been able to grow profits? Even profits are not growing. So, for how long will you have a situation where profit keeps oscillating between 850 crores and 1200 crores and stock price keeps compounding? It cannot grow to the sky. So, that's sometime soon either the uh, profits have to shoot up or price has to correct. One of the two has to happen. It cannot go on like this. How has been the valuations in this SDFC Times journey of last 10 years? Has SDFC Times become ever it become so expensive in the last say, 10 years? Or say Sun Pharma? See, you will have this dilemma and someone will say, so what if Infosys has not given returns for uh, since 2000? I bought it in 95 or whenever it got listed. I have made decent money even today, CAGR. I don't care about selling, which is a maybe a valid point. But if you could have sold out at not at the peak, at 25% lower than the peak, 30% lower than the peak, 
and bought something else sensible you still would have made so one way of looking at it is despite not selling i am getting a dec decent cagr that is one approach if that is the approach if your cost price is very low you don't care about what happens to the stock even if it falls 50% your cagr is good it's your call but i am looking at it from a opportunity cost perspective i am looking at that thing as real money today if you go to your stock broker and sell that stock you will get hard cash look at it like this you have that hard cash in your bank account today would you go out and buy it afresh at this price see a lot of people have this argument buy and hold for the long term don't get swayed by the temporary overvaluation i am in that camp in fact i am someone who is in firmly in that camp i am not someone who says if you are not going to buy it today then sell it there is a price range where there is a hold surely but what is that range see intrinsic value is never a point estimate you can't say with precision intrinsic value is for bosch is 8925 rupees you can't say that with precision you can say intrinsic value is between 5000 and 9000 for example so you don't sell it at 5000 you don't sell it at 6 7 8 9 10 whatever but is your range intrinsic value is from 5000 to 30000 now uh, the range can't be that high at 25000 rupees has the intrinsic value been breached surely without any doubt maybe it has maybe it has not it's a personal judgment call that people have to take as i said i am just asking questions Uh, very crude mathematical sure. You know this growth figure which you said. You know way back in one of Parash's first lectures, we had explained one thing that uh, your growth will be growth will be more than average. Now this is the bottom line of the whole investment. It's correct or wrong? Right? So similarly in all these companies, a very very crude formula which. As we are using is, if you take a five-year profit figure, and which is actually four years technically, because it's A to B to C to T to E. If the uh, growth has been, let's say, hundred percent, then the top end which you can buy at a P multiple is half of that is fifty, and uh, at half of that, that is at twenty-five, you are very comfortable buying this stock. So if you are at the top end at fifty, you must buy in a SIP and not at one share. And if you are at 25, you are safe. But you have to be sure that growth will continue for the next five years. So you have to have some basic knowledge of the company. So here, say, let's say a company is growing. A company is growing, let's say, at 30%. But if stock price is growing at 60%, then gradually, one, the valuation is becoming expensive relative to sales, relative to earnings, whatever. And second, you are extrapolating saying that past growth rate will continue indefinitely into the future and uh, just to uh, give you uh, some examples like uh, one of the mentors of parag bhai and someone who would come to our office quite regularly a mr chandrakant sampat who was uh, there now he was a big proponent of these kind of companies uh, fmcg companies high return on capital and uh, efficient companies and all that still at one point in time he said lever at this time multiple of sales i cannot imagine why it should trade at this price and he came and dumped his entire lever which he would have held for maybe 20 30 years he dumped the thing entirely and he came in cash and by coincidence or his foresight or whatever for maybe 7 8 years after that lever went nowhere but down or it was range bound so what happens is when things become excessively valued or when a huge growth rate has come it may not extrapolate indefinitely and i'll uh, bring you back to that rama bijapurkar's talk that i had given in our comp in our fof saying that indian economy will grow and that translates into growth in fmcg products is not a one to one 
linear relationship which, which you can take it for granted. She has given examples where people did not see growth and they went deeper to find out why is the, this growth not coming. And she said, as people become wealthy, they want to diversify their consumption basket. So earlier they were just consuming FMCG products of a lever or a Nestle maybe. When they had more income and when they got access to credit, loans from banks and all that, they aspired to buy a motorcycle, they aspired to buy homes and a big portion of their income was pre-allocated to paying EMI of that. So for many years, FMCG companies did not see sales growth even in an environment where uh, the whole economy was growing. So uh, saying that just because something like page has grown at uh, X rate so far, it will grow at the same X rate for another 10 years or 20 years is somewhat simplistic. I am not saying whether it will grow or not grow, but there could be questions. Will Calvin Klein come in and compete? Will Fruit of the Loom come and compete? Will lower price Indian brands compete? Uh, could there be a scenario where uh, the franchise agreement comes to an end? So just extrapolating it and the more expensive you, you buy something, the more the risk. If you have bought it cheap and expectations are not built into the price, you have something called margin of safety. So uh, Buffett said this, three most important words in investing, margin of safety. Today, none of these companies in my view have margin of safety. They have strong stories behind them, but MOS is not there and that is the risk. Uh, what do you think about uh, the outlook for Reliance industry present situation? No, no view. Page is selling to Indian consumers with the brand. It's not exporting to the other guys. Only, that is the secret of the location. They're just using the brand. They're just using the brand. Yeah, they have a they pay royalty to the parent company. They sell jockey branded and speedo branded things in India. That is the good story. Just to add to your Interesting point. So, Jubilant has been seeing stress in terms of growing same store sales. So, you can't blindly extrapolate something which has worked in the past indefinitely into the future. Interesting point. So, e-commerce is a new thing. It's changing the way people are uh, doing business. If they are not going to malls, obviously they are not ordering that pizza or a KFC or a burger in the mall. Interesting. So everything is not in the bu in a bubble zone in the market. There are alternatives. So. Uh, and this is no secret if you go to our website and compare two different fact sheets we have been trimming our position in Ikra for example it's a company we just love and we are even uh, positive about the prospects going forward in terms of Moody's ownership and all but somewhere things are getting stretched we are trimming the positions and basically we would sell something we are not comfortable with and we would buy something else where prospects are looking good and valuations are attractive. It's not a across the market phenomena. It's not a Arshad Mehta time where sell everything and make a bank fixed deposit. I am not calling a bust kind of scenario. So then obviously this theory of holding periods forever doesn't work. He himself has said, so he has said I should have sold Coca-Cola. He's admitted it. Uh, 
uh, and uh, recently if you look at his investments he's been selling uh, plenty of stuff uh, his privately owned businesses he's not been selling but listed stocks now you see sales happening Actually, a talk on this. So, uh, it's called uh, optical illusion of a P ratio, and how I have compared it with uh, the kind of cash flow that a company generates. So, I have said that in certain cases, a 8 P will be exactly equal to a 24 or a 25 P with numerical examples. So, uh, I don't have it uh, readily available, but if you go online and check out the website, it's there. It's called optical illusion of P ratio. Sorry to, uh, I have no view on Reliance, so there is no... My question was the penetration of Reliance. Hmm. Basically, it's No, it's a conglomerate. It's very difficult to understand, and we don't have a view. So, no view on it per se. Thanks. You got to remember the law of the farm. You cannot sow something today and reap tomorrow. A seed has to go through various seasons before it turns into a fully blown tree. So is the case with investments. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.